Good morning, church. A very good morning to you. We are looking at aligning to the decrees of God, aligning ourselves to the word of God, the will of God, and the purposes of God this morning. So we'll go to our first slide. We'll look at the scripture that's going to be like kicking off this uh, sermon, right? Amos 3, verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? This is from the New King James Version. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? What does this mean? The word align, alignment. What are we looking at with regards to this? Firstly, it is about a reconciliation, being reconciled, being in agreement, being synchronized and harmonized in terms of your purposes, in terms of your principle. This means we have a unity of thought. I'm looking at the word of God. That means when we walk together with God, we come into agreement. You cannot walk with someone, you cannot go with someone to a certain uh, place without being in agreement with that person. For example, that person may want to go to Kepong Baru, but you might want to go to Sentul or Petaling Jaya or something like that. That, uh, you know, we, we have heard about this, this phrase, right? You cannot be, uh, you know, rowing, the two fellas cannot be in a kayak rowing in different uh, directions. One cannot be rowing north, the other cannot be rowing south because you end up not moving anywhere or you might just, topple over into the sea, I mean, into the river. That's the, the, the thing where it comes to alignment. You cannot move forward or in any direction unless you are both aligned together. And when it comes to God, we cannot move together with the Lord. We cannot move in Him. We cannot know Him. We cannot have a relationship with the Lord unless we come into alignment with the Lord. This alignment is moving forward in the same direction moving forward and coming into agreement in the what, in the why, in the when, and the how. What basically is, what is the direction? Where is God going? What is he doing? We must know where he is going. We must know what he is doing. And we must be in agreement with what he is doing and what he wants to do. Number two, why? Why are we going along? What is the motivation for us? Even to serve God, to come into uh, agreement with the Lord, our why, our what has to be in line with God's word. The timing, even, you know, when, when we are serving God, when we are doing things for the Lord or rather in the Lord, what is the motivation? Are we, are we there when the cameras are not rolling or are we only there when the cameras are rolling? The timing, are we doing it when God wants us to do it or do you want to do something it may be the, a good thing, but do you want to just do it when you feel like it? When you want to, do you want to serve God when you feel like it? That is the, 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 the thing, right? Doing what God wants to do. Having the motivation. You are doing it because you understand why God wants you to do it. And that is why you want to do it too. God loves people. You love people. So you serve people. When the timing, when God asks you to do it, you go in and do it. You don't do it at your convenience. You do it even when it is inconvenient. Amen. And how you do it. It's not, sometimes we have heard this phrase. It's okay as long as the ends justify the means. It's not about doing something that is right in the wrong way. When it comes to doing things, when it comes to alignment, we have to do what is right in the sight of the Lord the way that is right in the sight of the Lord. When you do things, it has to, the, the right thing has to be done rightly. And, you know, the, 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 the whole package, the what, the why, the when, and the how. This is pretty critical because when it comes to uh, doing this, God looks at the heart, right? God looks at our entire being. We cannot walk together with the Lord unless we are totally in agreement with God. God is, you know, it's either he's Lord of all or master of nothing. When we pass, pass him, I mean, pass our lives, when we surrender our lives to God, it has to be 100%. It is a progressive process, but it has to be in alignment with God. 
And that's what we are looking at. There must be a unity of thought. Our thoughts must line up with the word of God. Our words, what we speak must line up with the word of God. Our actions must reflect the purposes, the plans, the will of God. Amen. That is alignment. And uh, very interestingly, uh, just reminded of this verse, Matthew 5, 23 to 24, where, uh, you know, the, the, the why, the, the why we do it in, in terms of, sorry, the how, the, the ends, uh, you know, it's not so much about the ends justifying the means. They have to line up. So God, Jesus is so particular. He talked about this guy, you know, he said, he talked about people, you know, when you come to bring an offering to the, to the table, when you bring an offering to the altar, your heart has to be in line with your brother. You're, you must be reconciled with your brother. If, when, you're, when you're worshiping God, even, you know, God, he placed relationship. I mean, I don't know, when I, when I see this particular verse in, in Matthew 5, 23, 24, he talks about first, when you bring, you know, your offering to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. First, be reconciled to your brother. Don't even come and serve. Go reconcile. Don't even come and worship. Reconcile to your brother. Then come and worship. Jesus is so particular about how we do what is right. Not just about doing what is right, but about doing the right thing the right way. Amen. That is so critical when it comes to alignment. Let's move to the next slide. We look at what we are aligning ourselves with. First one we're looking at is to align ourselves to his word. Let's read this together. Colossians 1. Verse 13. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. I'm going to read this again. The Father, that is God, has delivered and drawn us out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Basically, what God has done through Jesus is that he has delivered us. He has removed us completely out of the kingdom of darkness. Sin, the devil, death, disease, these have no dominion over us. They have got no more control. When Adam sinned, of course, man fell under the control of the devil. But Jesus has delivered us. He has brought us out. Sin shall have no dominion over us, Paul said in the book of Romans. Basically, what God has done is he has moved us out completely, transferred us into the kingdom of his son of love. There's another uh, verse, there's another verse that lines up with this. This is in 1 Peter 2, 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, I'm reading from the Amplified Translation, right? This says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation a special people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, in terms of aligning to the word of God, when we come into the word of God, we know for a fact that God has delivered us. We know for a fact that he has taken us out. These two verses, 1 Colossians 1.13, the Father has delivered us, drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion of you know, darkness and has transfer, transferred us into the kingdom of, his, of the Son of his love. And then he talks about us being in 1 Peter 2.9, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession so that you that is you and i we may proclaim the excellencies and wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light basically what it is saying is that we have been delivered we have been translated into the kingdom of the son his son right the son of his love into his marvelous light and god has assigned us with a mandate. He has given us a mandate. He has delivered us. He has called us. He has anointed us and he has appointed us with a divine mandate to bring his love, to proclaim the excellencies, his excellencies, 
the wonderful deeds, virtues, and perfections of him. That is, of God, of the Lord, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. What are we to do? We are carriers of the presence of God. In the Old Testament, the glory of God was held within a box, right? The Ark of the Covenant. Today, the glory of God lives in living, in breathing temples of the Holy Spirit, temples of God, temples that are not made, you know, with hands, not man-made, but God designed, God made, God devised. You and I who carry his presence by the Spirit of God who lives in us. Jesus lives in us by his Holy Spirit. Amen. And we are called to reflect Jesus. We are called to enforce his victory. He won the victory on the cross. Colossians 2, uh, 13, 14, where you know, he triumphed over them. He erased the handwriting of death and doom and gloom over our lives. And he triumphed over the devil, made a public spectacle of all the hosts of hell, all the forces of darkness in the cross. Amen. And through his blood, he has delivered us, purchased our salvation, purchased our redemption by his blood. And today he lives in us by his spirit. What are we called to do? We are his ambassadors. We are his enforcers. We reflect Jesus. You know, when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus, the imputed righteousness of Jesus in our lives. Amen. When the devil sees us, he sees the Jesus that trashed him up, the Jesus that beat him up, the Jesus that completely humiliated him and made him a public spectacle, dragging him, you know, like, past, you know, armies that, you know, you watch in these movies where when they have captured a certain nation, uh, you know, what they do is they put these chains around the necks of their enemies and drag them across the street, parading them for all to see. This is what Jesus did to the devil. Parading him for all to see. He, the devil is a defeated foe. We are God's enforcers, the enforcers of his victory. We fight from a position of victory. We operate from our position where we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So when it comes to aligning with the world, we have to understand who we are in Christ. We have to know the Lord, who he is, and we have to know who we are in him. We are called to reflect Jesus. We are called to enforce his victory. We are called to exalt him with our lives. We talked about alignment earlier. This alignment with the word is where we speak his word, we decree his word, we declare his truth in our lives. You know, some years ago, somewhere in 2018, if I remember correctly, uh, I was in a mama about to have my breakfast. And suddenly this guy walks in, he's very agitated. He just kicks the tables uh, and chairs. And then the mamas, the people there are very, very, uh, they are shocked. A lot of them are very shocked with what this guy is doing. But he was clearly troubled. He was decently clothed, but he, you know, like a normal person, he was. He did not look like a wanker or anything like that. But he was in a very bad mood, and he was completely like, you know, whacked up there. He was just kicking things around, and then he, he went over to where the mamaks kept the cutleries, the knives, the forks, and and sorry, the forks and spoons, right? And he just threw it over and just toppled it over on the floor. And then he just came, and I was just looking at him and he walked towards me and what i did was initially i was a, a, a bit agitated i thought of getting up and 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 kind of like responding to this man but somehow god's spirit kind of like convicted me to just pray in the spirit i was just praying in the spirit praying in, in tongues under my breath and as this man walked towards me i just looked at him and i said do you want to sit down and everyone around me was shocked in fact i was shocked that i had asked him to sit down and he looked at me and i said okay and he sat down and uh, I asked him what had happened, to, what, what, is, what is wrong with him? And he started telling me about things that were wrong with his life, with his wife, with his kids, with his parents, with his job. Practically, his life was like a horror story. It was completely in a mess. And I was still praying in tongues as he was talking to me, praying in tongues under my breath. And I was thinking, God, what am I going to tell this man? What am I going to do, you know, this guy? And suddenly I said, okay, can I pray for you? He looked at me and he said, okay. That shocked me more than I think, you know, uh, I care to admit, I was really shocked. I was shocked that I asked him. I was even more shocked that he agreed for me to pray. And all these guys, were, uh, the mamaks were my friends. I, I mean, uh, it's a regular mamak that I go to. 
uh, it's somewhere near my wife's office in Jalan Sultan Ismail. And I go there very regularly. Uh, you know, when I drop my wife off after that, I just have a drink or, or, or breakfast there. And I've been going there for, for quite a while. And, and, and this time the mom were looking at me and they were trying to see what I was doing, as well as those guys who were seated there. I was as shocked as anybody there. And then I just said, okay, I'll pray for you. And I just prayed in tongues under my breath. And then after that, I just prayed, prayed and asked God to bless him and ask for God's peace to just come upon him. And he had tears in his eyes. And then I uh, asked him what he wanted to eat. And of course, he took uh, roti telur or something like that uh, and, and had a drink. Mama, the mama blanjar him, the, the mama sponsored him. Uh, and then he gets up and he leaves. After he left, the mama came over to me and then he sat down and said, brother, you know what? There was a change in the atmosphere when he spoke to him. And he said something about the tension in the atmosphere just releasing. This is a mama. Uh, he's not a believer, right? And, and I said, okay, you know, yeah. And then I just kind of like left it there came back, I mean, that my wife and I came back home. One of the things that he said to me really impacted me, you know, the atmosphere changed. We changed the atmosphere. On thinking back, what I did was I connected with the Lord and it was the Holy Spirit who came in there and enabled me to connect because if, you, if there's me on a normal day, I would have responded very differently. But God enabled me to be an instrument to minister to this man, but change the atmosphere. When you and I, we carry the presence of God. We have to be aware that we carry the presence of God and we have to be the people that release Jesus. We are called to release Jesus and the atmosphere in the place where God has put us in the sphere of our existence, the sphere of our influence, even in our families, in our neighborhoods. You know, we talk about dominate our flagship prayer altar, right? 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. every Saturday. What we do sometimes is we walk the land. Earlier, Pastor Fox was talking about you know going into the place where our our Disara Central is right. Even as it is being uh, renovated, to go there and pray, to go there and bring the presence of God into that place. Because you and I, we carry the presence of God, and we are called to release Jesus, reflect Jesus, and force His victory as we exalt Jesus. We worship God when we are walking around. I mean, in that place, in that mama, we just, you know, I believe I have released the presence of God. And, and there's another, another interesting story I want to share with you. Uh, when we first moved to Sungai Bolo 20 years ago, on the first week itself, I wanted to just get out of Sungai Bolo. Because when we came into Sungai Bolo, Kapong Bridge, the one that leads from uh, Kuala Selangor right through Sungai Bolo into MRR2, there were cracks on it. So that time, I think our works minister was, uh, was Sami Velu, and he decided they will shut down the bridge. So no access to MRR2. A couple of weeks later, there was a slight flood and the exit we take into the NKVE, the New Klang Valley Expressway, is from, uh, you go up into the ramp where Sierra Mas is, and you turn to your right into the Sungai Boloto. We could not do it because there was a flood and the bridge was damaged and they had to repair it. So what we had to do was get a take uh, a shortcut through a kampong and come out through Kota Damansara, um, the Kota Damansara way, and then cut into uh, the LDP and then go off to uh, the, the PJ Road East End, you know, that, that way into KL. Uh, and it used to take us about one and a half hours. Prior to that, Denise and I, after we got married, uh, we lived in PJ Section 17, and it only took us about. 20 minutes to get to KL, but now it's like one and a half hours. And I was like, really, God, you know, what was happening? I just wanted to get out of there, but God dealt with me, praise God. And at that time, we used to go through this kampong, right? And, and one day when we were going through this kampong road, we stopped at the traffic light and a dog just appeared. This dog was like, it had no skin on it. It had a uh, mange. It Practically all its fur, I mean, it had no fur on it. All its fur had dropped. And you could see the pink skin and you could see the sores all over its body. And the thing about this was, there was a wound on its head that was probably as big as my fist. 
and it was like festering and you could see flies around it. You could even see maggots dropping out of it. And what my wife did, I looked at it and in my mind, I was like, okay, this dog is gone, like, you know, it's a goner. My wife, what she did was she prayed. She just stretched out her hand and, and she said, you know, in the name of Jesus, I speak life over you. I speak life over you. And she told, she decreed that the dog will live and not die, that the dog will be restored. She was talking about the fur of the dog growing back, about the skin coming back to normal. And the thing, you know, the, the, the wound on the head closing up. I really did not have much faith as she prayed. I was just driving my focus. was, okay, get out of here, you know, go, go to KL, go to work, right? But she just kept praying. And, and, and after that, uh, she just kept praying in tongues. For, for a while, probably about 30 minutes or thereabouts. And then we passed through this, uh, this kampong. This kampong had drug addicts, robbers, you name it. Like, it was really messed up, really stinky. They had lots of uh, stalls and, 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 and stuff kind of like, uh, like dotted across the road. And it was quite a, quite a messy place. But as we passed by, suddenly Denise decided to pray for the, for the, for the kampong. And she was decreeing the word of God, saying that, you know, bless these people, cause them to know you, let your presence come and, uh, you know, overshadow this place. As she did that, I prayed along with her and agreed with her, really, you know. Uh, and, and, and about three weeks later, we, we kept taking that road after that. And we still do that, some, you know, uh, going to work now. Although, uh, yeah, uh, it's easier to, today because they've got another another toll gate there, uh, the Sungai Bolo Hospital Sungai Bolo toll. So we still take it, but that whole area has changed so much. That whole area has changed. It's become cleaner, brighter. The atmosphere is really different. You know, it's it's a real change. That is the kampong. The kampong and the people were transformed. Going back to the dog, three weeks later, I saw that dog. That very same dog, fur had grown back. The skin, you know, the the kid wound had kind of like covered back and, and some months down the road, the dog was completely healed. It is about us taking that, that, that the word of God and speaking it, proclaiming it. And, and, and what Denise did after that was she, you know, after praying for the dog, she just thanked God and said, thank you Lord for healing uh, this, this dog. Thank you God for your hand upon this people. Reflect Jesus and force his victory. They exalt Jesus and proclaim his majesty. You know, Pastor Chu reminds us uh, quite often as he preaches, right? Introduce light. Displace darkness. When we get into the place where God has put us, we introduce light. We carry the presence of God. We are called to diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus in every place. You and I are light bearers. We carry the presence of God. We speak the word of God. You know, when we walk around our house, when we walk around and we drive around the roads, we decree, Lord Jesus, come and rule over this atmosphere. We decree your lordship over this place. We bless this place in Jesus' name. As we do that, we are speaking the word of God. We are thanking God for the people. We are thanking God for that, that atmosphere. We drive down uh, Bisara Central and we praise God for that place. We praise God for his presence in that place. We praise God that people are going to come in and encounter Jesus. We praise God for our church, for all of you guys, that this year is going to be a year like no other in your lives. You're going to be blessed beyond any curse. You're going to encounter the reality of Jesus in your lives at every level. This is what we are called to do. We, when we are aligned with the word of God, we speak life, we decree the truth of God's word. It's not positive confession, but it is the decreeing and the declaration of the word of God. Not buta buta declare something, just blindly declare something. You see, God is not obliged to answer or fulfill a prayer or a decree or a declaration that does not line up with the word of God. Amen. Our declaration must line up with the word of God. Our motivations must be in line with his will and his purpose. When we have internalized God's word in our lives, his power is manifested through us. Amen. This is what happens when the spiritual 
impacts the natural. Sometimes people tell us, hey, why are you guys so spiritual? One? Yesterday at the Dominic altar, Pastor Fergus was saying this. He said something about what happens in the spiritual eventually impacts the natural. Everything is spiritual. That doesn't mean you walk around with, with a hello on our head or you, know, or you walk around like, if you guys are as old as I am, anyone born 1970, 1980, or even before, or before that, you would have seen this movie, The Six Million Dollar Man or The Bionic Man, right? When he walks, he has got this sound, the, uh, uh, special effect. When you talk about spiritual Christians, it does not mean, it does not, it's not referring to walking like Bionic Man or having a special effect when you go, when you walk or having a hello around your head. It's about being real, living out our lives as pleasing to God, amen, and taking the truth of God and impact, letting it impact us first, and then with that truth, impacting our atmosphere, impacting our families, impacting our friends, impacting our church, impacting our nation and the nations of the world. That is alignment with the word, aligned to his word, amen. When we are aligned to the word of God, we exalt Jesus and we release Jesus. We release the presence of God. Amen. Let's go on to the next slide. Aligned to his will. Joshua 1, 3. One of the interesting things that always bothered me in a sense was the Israelites, remember God in, gave the land of Canaan as an inheritance to Abraham so many years before. 400 years later, the Israelites had now multiplied to a large nation in this, uh, what do you call it, in this womb of sorts that was Canaan, uh, sorry, Egypt. Now Moses had delivered them out of Egypt and, uh, and, and he was taking them out. God had delivered them through Moses and now uh, the Israelites were on their way to possess the promised land. What happened was this. In uh, Numbers 13, I want to just give you a minute. Let me just turn to uh, Numbers 13. Numbers 13, verses 1 to 2. The land was given as an inheritance. It was bequeathed to uh, the children of Israel. It was given to Abraham and his descendants forever, right? Now, it, as it was bequeathed to Abraham, it was an inheritance that God had given. Basically, God had given uh, Israel the title deed to the land of Canaan, right? Now, inheritance must be claimed, right? As Israel had come out from Egypt, passed through the desert, and as they were on the threshold of getting in to the land of Canaan, this is what happened. I'm going to read from Numbers 13, verses 1 to 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Follow me if you can. Yeah? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone, a leader among them. Basically, there are so many scriptures that point us to the fact that God had already given this land to Abraham and his descendants. And now in Numbers 13, God just told them, spy out the land and then take the land, obviously, right? But the spies came back and they had some mixed uh, opinions. 12 spies went, 10 of them came back and they had some rather interesting, uh, what do you call it, input. But they all said something like this. They all said that the land was a good land. They all came back and they said, this is a land that is dwelling, I mean, that is flowing with milk and honey. I'm reading from verse 27, Numbers 13, 27. When they, told, when they came back, they told him, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell there are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anaphe, and on and on and on. But the 10 spies were saying this, right? 
Caleb rises up and he says this. Let us go up. Caleb quieted the people before Moses. He basically told them, chill or shut up. And he said this. Let us go up at once and take possession of it. For we are well able to overcome. Caleb reflected faith. He was walking in obedience with the Lord. And he said, we are able to overcome. Let's go up and take it. See, God has said, go. What were they waiting for? But the man who had gone up was 31. But he said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. stature. Then we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from giants. Okay, this is in parenthesis. And this is what we said. This is so, so, I, I don't think it's interesting. It's so bad. This is how they viewed themselves. They viewed themselves as grasshoppers. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. See, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. In their own eyes, they were grasshoppers. And they figured that the Canaanites saw them also as grasshoppers. You know, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, as a man thinks, so is he. They, God had given them this land, but they saw themselves as grasshoppers. They had, they never once mentioned that they were able to take the land. Their eyes were on themselves and on the challenge they faced. But none of them had their eyes on the Lord, right? In Numbers 14, verse 9, there's a very interesting statement made by Joshua. And this is what he says. I'm going to read from Numbers 14, verse 8 onwards. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land which flows with milk and honey. Joshua says, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Joshua got his perspective right. Caleb got his perspective right. Joshua basically says, they are break for us. I think that's where this, the, the phrase came. That means no, no sweat. We can take them. Their protection has departed from them. And why can we beat them? Because the Lord is with us. But what happened to us? As we know, inheritance must be claimed by faith and obedience. When we walk in faith, we are basically telling God that God, I trust you. And I know that I know that I know that you are a God who watches over your word to perform it. Jeremiah 1 verse 12, where God says, I will watch over my word to perform it. That means that we know that God is able to do what he has promised. God is able to deliver what he has promised. That is a people who knows their God. Amen. Let us be a people who know our God, a people who trust in God. You know, God was really upset with these guys. Uh, and and uh, in, in the book of Hebrews, he goes on to say that they were not able to go into this place because they doubted him. They rejected the Lord. This is what I think it's in Hebrews. Uh, somewhere in the book of Hebrews, God mentioned about this. Paul mentions this. Just give me a second. Let me just uh, come back to this one. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, it basically says that they did not enter the rest, their rest. They did not enter God's rest because of disobedience and unbelief. Inheritance must be claimed. We must step up in faith with diligent effort to possess what God has already bequeathed to us. Canaan had to be conquered and enemies had to be displaced before Israel could progressively claim her inheritance. Remember God said, little by little. What is our Canaan today? 
what has God promised us today that we need to claim? Obedience reflects faith. Caleb and Joshua look to God's greatness while the other ten spies, they look at their own weakness. They were the ten spies whose doubt and unbelief disqualified them also ended up depriving an entire generation from fulfilling their destinies. Because of these ten guys, that whole generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, the whole generation died in the wilderness. Ten months disobedience cost an entire nation its inheritance. Spiritual, physical too. Grasshoppers versus bread for us. What is our estimation of ourselves? Is it in alignment with God's estimation? Our estimation of ourselves must be in alignment with God's estimation. We must align our thinking. We must align our words. We must align our actions to his word. Amen. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is inside is what comes out. What we think eventually. As a man thinks, so is he. Proverbs 23 verse 7. What we speak is so critical. Proverbs 18.21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it shall eat its fruit. You speak life, you speak the word of God, you are sowing the word of God. You reap the word of God. You speak death. That's what you end up reaping. Let us remember this and let us remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, to internalize the word of God. Speak the word of God. Someone asked me, so what, why didn't this generation go in? Obviously because of doubt and unbelief. Did God want them to possess the land? Did God give the land to them? Yes, yes, yes. They forfeited it by their own actions. Today, we are standing on the threshold. So many things that are happening, but we are standing on the threshold of change. We are standing on the threshold of possibly the greatest revival that's going to happen across the face of this earth, in this nation, even in our families. We have challenges. We have issues that are before us. Just like the Israelites, they had giants. They had the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the, 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 the Hewites, the Jebusites, all these fellas. Yet God promised them victory. And God is more than able. He's not just able to overcome our enemies. He's willing to help us overcome. Amen. Let us look at the final slide. We have seen alignment at three levels. We have seen alignment. What is alignment? Alignment to his word. Alignment to his will. And finally, let's align ourselves to his victory. Jericho basically marked, this is in, in Joshua chapter 6, Jericho marked Israel's breakthrough where possessing the land of Canaan was concerned. It was a stronghold that held Israel back until God brought them through. And today, what is our Jericho? What is that spiritual or, spirit or, or physical? Is it a spiritual or physical problem that has been there? That is something like a giant that is the first thing we remember when we get up or the last thing we remember before we go to bed. Something that is just nibbling at us. Something that is there right in front of us. Something that we need to deal with. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Even as Pastor Fergus uh, reminded us earlier, and he's, he prayed for an outpouring of the Spirit of God over our church, over our lives. Today, as we look at aligning ourselves to his victory, let's bring our Jericho before the Lord. I'll just run us through this quickly, where we can look at how Israel and Joshua overcame Jericho. And let's see if we can glean some divine principles from the word of God to deal with it. Even as we come into alignment with God, come into alignment with his decree. And let's invite the Holy Spirit as we go through this to align us this morning to God's word in Joshua 6 and see how Israel made their breakthrough. Amen. Number one, Joshua chapter 6 verse 1. 
they saw the city of Jericho and they saw something very interesting about Jericho. It was tightly shut up, right? Now Jericho was tightly shut up. What that meant simply was that it was humanly impossible for them to get through. They were not able to get through. They were not able to break through into the city. And they needed, they saw the problem as beyond them. They saw the problem as something that was not humanly possible. And they knew that this challenge was bigger than them. We face some challenges that are bigger than us. And it takes God's intervention to deliver us, right? Like Israel, we need God to help us to break through into Jericho, to overcome our Jericho, to bring the walls of Jericho down. They saw things from God's perspective. They saw the problem. It was something that was beyond them. But then they remembered God's word where God said that they will overcome it. Joshua chapter 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, none went out, none came in. Nobody could go into Jericho. Nobody could come out. But then this was the problem, right? Tightly shut up city. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. They saw, they, he grabbed God's word. When we see the challenge facing us through the eyes of faith, then we'll be able to grasp that our God is more than able to save us and rescue us and deliver us. Our God is bigger than anything and everything out there. We know that, amen. And he has given us this authority. Nothing is too difficult for the maker of the universe. Isaiah 40 says that the entire creation fits between the span of God's hand between the distance of his thumb and his pinky. This is the awesome God that he served. Amen. You recognize the problem. You see things from God's perspective. And then we go on to acting by faith. We seek the Lord and we submit to the Holy Spirit's prompting. This is in verse 3. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. It's quite an interesting strategy God gave them. They wanted to break through a city, but God told them to go walk around the city. They walked around the city 13 times. Six days, one time. The final day, seven times. 13 times, you walk around the city. Unconven unconventional strategy. But when they obeyed the Lord, they saw victory. Some years ago, a prayer team from SIBKL went to Baram. We were with them and we, uh, we led a prayer team to Baram. And as we were there uh, going through uh, the Baram Valley, what happened was at that time they were going to be building the Baram Dam. In 2011, they, uh, the government was building, you know, they wanted to build the Baram Dam and they designated, I think, some 589 hectares of land that they're going to like dam up, close up, and, and flood. And they're going to displace so many uh, people, natives, as well as flood the rivers. And of course, lots of wildlife and habitat will be, habitat will be destroyed. And there are lots of people from uh, the church, uh, you know, SIB KL, uh, sorry, SIB, SIB uh, Sarawak. A lot of them, there are a lot of SIB churches there. In that area itself, we visited about 12 SIB churches at that time. And they, 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 the whole atmosphere was like, these guys were like, you know, they were just praying and asking God to intervene. Of course, the government had signed this thing and they were going ahead with the damn project. So we, we, we went on top of this, this Baram River and there's this bridge and you're praying there and, and the word of God came to one of us to speak over that river and to speak over that area to decree that this dam will not be complete. This dam will not proceed. And so we prayed and we declared the word of God over that place saying that this dam will not take place. It will not, you know, it will not pro proceed. There will be no Baram then. Full stop. And there was a word of God. We came back. This was in 2011. They continued. They continued uh, you know, with, with the, the preparatory works and all that. And suddenly, in, 2014, in 2014, it just stopped. They just stopped and said, okay, this thing is not going to go ahead. The fact is this. At that time, when we prayed and declared it, it sounded like foolishness to us. And we were like, God, is this real? But among all the team members, there was this assurance that this was the voice of God. 
And when we came back today, it's quite easy to look back in retrospect and say, wow, God, you are able, you are able. That time, we had calls from people asking us, did you really hear the voice of God? Did you really hear the voice of God? It took us three years plus. It took three years plus for the word of God to come to pass. He didn't just, we didn't just walk around the bridge seven times and it stopped. No. But you know what? God brings things to pass. God watches over his word to perform it. Sometimes we just have to hold on and see things with our eyes of faith and take God at his word. I remember a, a, a very interesting song by Don Francisco. It says that there's more that stand on our side no matter what you see. It doesn't matter how it seems, how strong the enemy. Don't believe your eyes. Believe your father's guarantee. There's more that stands on our side no matter what you see. Indeed, there is more that stands on our side. Amen. Israelites recognized the problem. They saw that they couldn't deal with it, but they had God's word. They saw things from God's perspective. They acted by faith. They walked around seven times on the last day, six times on the first six days, and on the last day, seven times, 13 times. The walls fell down. They prayed circles. I believe that when they were walking around, they were, you know, they, they blew the trumpets, right? Once, once, and then after that, seven times. The thing is this. When they did that, the blowing of the, of the, of the, of the, the ram's horns is basically done in the year of Jubilee, the 50th year. It's done to, to kind of like decree or declare freedom, redemption, and victory. Amen. In this case, as they were going around, they were not grumbling, they were not murmuring, they were not complaining. They were praising God. They were walking around in faith, knowing that God will fulfill what he has promised. Even as we are praying, some of us could be like the priests, like the Israelites, walking around our Jericho today. Know this, that God will perfect that which concerns you. Know this, that God will never, never allow you to be put to shame. Amen. As we are aligned to his decrees, as we are aligned to his word, to his will, and to his victory, we will see his glory manifested in our lives. And finally, when they went in to take the land, when they went in, right, what the Israelites did was this. They rushed uh, in to possess the land. All of them just got into that place and they did not. In Joshua 6 and verse 20, what happened was when the walls came down, the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, that the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They were 100% committed to the task. They did not look around to see what was happening. The moment the walls fell down, they went straight, they took the city. We need to know what God is doing. We need to hear his voice. We need to know God's heart and God, God's heart and God's mind in the matter. And when we hear the that trumpet sound, when we hear God's go ahead, we're not going to be looking around. We will be the sheep that hear the master's voice. We'll go straight on ahead to secure what God has already given us as an inheritance. That is what the church of Sumai Bolo is going to do. Amen. Praise God. And finally, Joshua did something very interesting. He, uh, in verse 26, he pronounced the curse over the land. Basically, that was, according to some commentators, it was so that Jericho will no longer be used as a base of operations by the enemy. It will still be with the Lord. And he said it will be with the, the death of the firstborn. You know, he'll lay the, the whoever builds the city will lay it with the, with, the, uh, with, with the death of his firstborn and, and, and he'll complete it with the death of his youngest. This is what uh, the guy who rebuilt the city ended up doing, right, uh, in the time of Ahab. The thing that happened was this. I think it was Heal the Beth Bethlehem in 1 Kings 16.34. He rebuilt it. What Joshua came, spoke came to pass. And in 1 Kings 16.34, it is recorded that the word that Joshua spoke over the city was the word of the Lord. In other words, it was the proclamation of the word of the Lord that secures the blessing from the hands of the enemy. What I'm saying is this. 
after we have prayed and secured the victory. Let us declare God's word. Let us, it's not about cursing something, but we speak life. We carry the presence of God. When you have prayed and seen victory established in a certain area, let's decree victory. I um, had a friend who's gone to be with the Lord now, Pastor Danny Pollock. Um, one thing he shared with me was when he prayed for the salvation of anyone for the matter, when he leads someone into a you know, prayer of salvation, right? He always did this. He said this to me. He said, every single person that he has led to the Lord has remained in the Lord and grown in the Lord. No one has backslided. And so I asked him, what is, your, what is the secret to this? He said, he pointed this particular verse to me. And he said, when you proclaim the word of God over the blessings that God brings into your life, you secure it. So I asked him, how so? How do you do that? He said, simply this. I'll just give you an example, right, of, how, of what he shared with me. He said, when he prays for, let's say he leads Mr. A to the Lord and Mr. A comes to the knowledge of God, he's received Jesus. What he does is finally he just prays and said, God, I pray that your hand will be upon so and so. That throughout his life, he will see open heaven. Throughout his life, he will not fall away from you. In Jesus' name. So he secures this man in a sense. And, and another person whom he brought with me was a testimony. He told me that, yes, he many times he, he went away, but somehow God brought him back. God brought him back. God brought him back. Amen. Recognize the problem. See the situation from God's perspective. Perform appropriate actions of faith. Act by faith. Confess your victory. Ensure total commitment and secure the blessing. Amen. We're going to pray. Amen. Father, we make way. Holy Spirit, we make room that each one of us will have a fresh encounter with you today. Even as we are starting this week and throughout this week and throughout this month and throughout this year, God, that 2021 will be a year of alignment for us. A year where we are aligned to you. Uh, Align to your word, align to your will, align to your victory. God. This morning, God, we lift our souls to you. We lift our hands to you this morning and say, Holy Spirit, come. Magnify yourself in our lives. That we will be indeed carriers of your presence. We don't want to live lives that lack your reality. We don't want to live lives that are devoid of your presence. We don't want to live lives that do not please you, God. Help us to be a church that honors you. Help us to be a people that pleases you. God, we bring every facet of our lives before you this month. We bring our families. We bring, Lord, uh, our relationships. We bring, God, our vocations. We bring our ministries. We bring our studies. We bring everything that pertains to us, God, and we lay it at your feet this morning. And we say, Holy Spirit, you take control. Holy Spirit, realign. Holy Spirit, you recalibrate. Holy Spirit, you cause us to walk and we teach us to please you, to please our Father. To fulfill the redemptive and prophetic, prophetic destinies that you have for us, God. And Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters who are gathered, Lord, here in this place, and whoever is going to be hearing this sermon, Father, by any other means, by media, electronic media, that your hand will be upon them. Your hand will be upon them, Father, that your tangible presence will just break through into the atmosphere of our lives right now, in Jesus' name. Let us never be the same again after this day. Even as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, let this be a milestone in our lives. Let this be a time where your spirit broke into our lives, broke through into our lives and broke out through us. Where there is a need for healing, Holy Spirit, you supply. Where there is a need for provision, Holy Spirit, you supply. According to your word. According to your word. According to your word, align us to you, God. Magnify yourself in us. We bless you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you. And bless you with his shalom. His prosperity, his peace, his presence. We give you his best in Jesus' name. Amen.